our guest now is John Foreman, Chief Data Scientist at MailChimp. John, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I read in your bio that you are you lead MailChimp's email genome project. Yep. What is that? Well, I'm not sure how familiar you are with MailChimp. We're one of the largest email service providers in the world. Uh, we have over three million customers who basically sign up for us if they want to send any kind of email marketing, and that could be anything from just hey, the neighborhood pool is opening this summer, I'm sending this to a couple hundred people, all the way up to large-scale e-commerce customers sending marketing material. And so the Email Genome Project came about because we realized we have customers all across the globe. Uh, we send about 4 billion emails now each month, and we get probably another 4 billion events on top of that, like opens, clicks, unsubscribes, mm -hmm. abuse reports, uh, all sorts of stuff shares on Facebook, on Twitter, and we realized all that data was getting siloed, so each user has their own MySQL database within our system, but we knew there was a ton of value there, and there was really no way to get at it in those silos, so we want it in one place. Hmm. And so we created the Email Genome Project. It's essentially an initiative inside of MailChimp to bring all that data in one location where we can build products off of it. Uh, a lot of these are internal products as well as products that face the customer. And so it came about a couple years ago, and uh, recently we've just started, once we had the infrastructure in place, okay, all of our sends are in one place, all of our clicks, all of our opens, mm -hmm. all of our email addresses, now we can start releasing all these products. So we just did one that detects bad users and kicks them out of the system, and uh, another product that helps good users understand what the email addresses on their list are interested in other than themselves. Uh, so they can understand how to better target them. So things like that. Is that only possible because it's all in one place? It doesn't have to be in one place, right? I mean, you could think about essentially all the data being in these various silos and running scripts, right? That sort of walk mm -hmm. all of your user shards across all of your data centers to do this. But having the data in one place, and by one place I don't mean just one gigantic <laughs> table, but um, right in one system, so we have a, a huge sharded Postgres system with an in-memory database on top of it. Having it kind of in one place really does help uh, us both run products off of it and uh, do sort of ad hoc analysis and test theories, right? It's not onerous for me to come up with a question like, you know, is it possible to create a graph out of our email addresses and determine uh, something off of an A-B test, what maybe people like A more, B more based on their friends in the system? You know, now I can test that theory out a lot quicker because the data's all in one place where I can get at it as opposed to hunting down a developer and saying, hey, I need you to write me some code that's going to go out and walk all these accounts. It's awful. Right. There's a real-time component, is that, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. So we're doing a few things in real time right now. The biggest is uh, an AI model we're calling Omnivore. And I guess because it eats good, user, good users and bad users. It sounds good. Yeah. It, um, the real-time component is essentially that we send email over a set number of IP addresses, and we have more customers than IP addresses. Um, so some customers have to share. But if you think about Gmail or Hotmail or any of those large ISPs receiving our mail, if they start getting spam from one of our customers, they're going to block the IP address. And then we're out of business, right? Because that user is not the only user who uses that IP address. It's a shared space. Mm -hmm. So we need to come up with a way when a user entered the system to shut them down if we thought they were bad, and that's before they sent. A lot of spam filtering used to be based on, okay, what did you send? Does it include the word Viagra? Yeah. Does it include the word Viagra with a one? Viagra with a one and an at symbol. Does it mention a Nigerian prince? Sure. You know, there's certain things people look for. That's not good enough, because the person has already sent that content um, a lot of those times, and we, we had a, on top of just looking at, at the content, we, we also had a, a team of humans who would go through and kind of look at your account metadata, you know, what's your IP address, where, where does that say you're from, where do we, you know, what does your domain say you're from, things like that, and then try to get, you know, a gut sense of whether they were bad. It, it wasn't enough. So we built an AI model that's a, a real-time component on top of the Email Genome Project that essentially looks at the list of email addresses you upload, looks at account metadata and content if you have it, and can decide, hey, this person is super bad, get them out of here before they send. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's worked very effectively for us at protecting our IP addresses. Uh, we can, it, it's great because we can prevent people from sending spam that aren't just your typical spammers. It could just be 
local real estate agent who doesn't know better, yeah. takes an email address list from the Chamber of Commerce and thinks they can just blast out ads mm -hmm. to their neighbors. You know, that's, that's spam. They might not know it's spam, sure. but we know it's spam, and so we can shut them down, and we can do it in a nice way and help educate them and then bring them back in. Yeah, interesting. So last question for you. Where do you feel we are in the maturation of real-time analytics? I mean, are these the early, early days? It kind of, well, it depends on what you mean by real-time analytics, right? So, um, I'm, I'm a math guy, not a tool guy, but in, in my experience, if we were just talking about sitting in a stream of data, uh, that, you know, maybe it's tweets or whatever, and somehow taking those in and doing simple transformations on them, maybe doing sentiment analysis, real quick things on individual records, mm -hmm. maybe doing some kind of reduction step. There are tools that do that pretty effectively. But when we think about something like the Email Genome Project, one thing that became very apparent to us early on was we can't just take our raw data that's streaming in and we're doing thousands and thousands of database requests each second. We can't take that raw data and just do analytics on that. We have to restructure it in very complex ways, which would mean uh, doing lots of aggregations, doing lots of join steps or things you might think of when you're doing a graph, uh, doing what would be called a window function where you're, you're placing events in order by, I, by email address maybe. You know, what are the last 10 cents we did this uh -huh. email address uh, and rolling those up. And when you start to get into that, a lot of times you have to roll your own tools, uh, unfortunately. Right? I think for that really complex analytics piece of summarizing data in unique ways to send through an AI model mm -hmm. and do that piece really quickly, um, we had to create our own system. You know, we had to use a terabyte of memory in Redis in RAM uh, to do a lot of this to make it fast enough and we kind of had to make it really custom. So I think we're going to head in that direction. Uh, people sort of being able to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to SQL plus really large databases plus we want to do stuff really fast, maybe in memory. Uh, I think we're going to end up there, but I don't, I don't know that we're necessarily there yet. Some time there. So great. Thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for time. having me.